you are welcome. He is a master mentor. He is the only one that can guide into truth. So in your own words, I want you to just welcome him. Welcome him tonight. Welcome him tonight. Bless him tonight. Let him hear your voice. Let him hear your own personal song to him. Come on and talk to the Lord tonight. Holy Spirit. of the Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, you are our master mentor. And tonight I ask that you open every heart. Open everyone's heart that is here and that is listening and watching online. Let every one of us receive your engrafted word with meekness. Let your word take root in our hearts tonight. Let none fall by the wayside. Confirm your word with power. Let scales fall from off of eyes. Bring conviction, revelation to hearts. And after all is said and done, Father, receive all of the glory, 100%, while we retain the blessing. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We love you. In Jesus' name, we have worshipped. Celebrate him tonight. Come on. Hallelujah. Welcome your brother, your sister to the left, right. Say, you are welcome tonight. I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad to see you. Thank you, Jesus. My hands are blessed. Blessed. With the blessings of God. Come on. night family you continue to do great blessed glorious in Jesus name I expected someone to say I am enjoying God's rest so let's do it one more time how are you doing tonight family and your rest shall be permanent in Jesus name no more warfare in your life in Jesus name your life and mine from now is forward ever backward never hallelujah I am glad to be back tonight. I celebrate your pastors, Pastor Shegun, Pastor Abike. Come on, join me. Oh, always to be standing up. Hallelujah. We honor you, sir. We honor you, ma. I don't take it for granted that I stand on this pulpit tonight and that I'm celebrating your 14th anniversary because like I said, like I said, I say it by the Lord. DLCC, get ready. Things are about to take a glorious ride up. Things are about to change radically. 
in this commission in this house, says the Lord of hosts. And I'm so glad that I'm right here at the crossroads of that. I can say I was there at the turning point, the pivotal point. You've not seen anything else yet, pastors. It's going to be glorious. God has something great in store, and I'm glad to be here. You may have your seat. God bless you. Of course, um, I, I appreciate my husband, the, not the love of my life. You know, I don't like to say that word. Sometimes we use some words that will make God himself jealous. Jesus is the only love of my life. But a very close second is my husband, Pastor Toya Ademola. Amen. He's doing awesome in East Africa right now. And I thank God if he said, sit down in the kitchen or stay in the bedroom. I won't be here right now. But I appreciate God that God gave me a husband who didn't say my place is only in the kitchen and bedroom. But at the pulpit, get me to celebrate my husband, Pastor Toye. Ademola. Amen. Tonight, I'm going to teach just like Pastor introduced me yesterday because that's how the Spirit of God wants us to go. So you can take notes tonight. We're going to read a lot of scriptures tonight as we continue in the topic, keys, three vital keys to supernatural advancement. This is part two. We are celebrating Acts chapter 9, verse 31 in the King James Version. And I'm going to read it in a personalized way. Then had the DLCC churches rest. DLC, all I need you to do is amen, resounding amen. amen. Then had the DLCC churches rest. Amen. DLCC San Ramon, amen. DLCC Stockton, amen. and DLCC San Jose, and all future DLCC churches throughout all the earth. And they were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. When you join edified with multiplied together, what you have is supernatural enlargement, supernatural advancement. Amen. In DIC at home is enlargement. DIC by church back home is supernatural enlargement, advancement, same thing. Amen. So these people, they experience supernatural advancement because they engage three powerful keys in that verse. And yesterday I shared with you the very first key. And the very first key is that you must have rest. The first thing we see in that scripture is that they had rest. I told you yesterday that without rest, supernatural advancement is not possible. No matter how much a person tries, if you are spending all your time fighting wars, if you are having to fight wars constantly, you will never be able to move forward in life. You can only advance when God gives you rest. I read to you yesterday, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 3 says, You know how my father David, this was Solomon speaking to Hiram, you know how my father David could not build a house, not that he did not try. He tried, but he could not. He could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. I thank God that yesterday night, God put your foes and my foes under the soles of our feet in Jesus' name. And then he said, but now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil or current. And behold, I propose to build a house for the Lord my God. And if you read 2 Chronicles 7, 11, he built that house. The Bible says that Solomon successfully finished. He successfully accomplished everything that came into his heart because there were no wars to hinder him. And DLCC, I say to you by the Lord, you have entered into your rest. No more wars to hinder you. No more satanic bombardment to stall your progress in the mighty name of Jesus. But remember I told you yesterday that the promise of rest is only for those who believe. Those who will seek for it. Seek the Lord for it in prayer. 
And that's what we took time to do yesterday because Hebrews says 4.3, For we who have believed do enter into that rest. Second Chronicles 14.7, concerning Asa, he said, Because we have sought the Lord our God, and we have sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So this promise of rest is for everybody. But only those who believe God and seek God for it in prayer, just like we did yesterday. Please, yesterday, prayer, it doesn't end there. It does not end there because we have a very stubborn enemy. And so we must always be vigilant, like the Bible says, be alert in the room of prayer. Praise the name of the Lord. Now today, we're going to discuss key number two. We see it in that verse. To the second part of the verse, the Bible says and walking in the fear of the Lord. So the second key for your supernatural advancement, I keep saying enlargement, for your supernatural advancement is you must walk in the fear of the Lord. Help me say after me, say, I must walk in the fear of the Lord. People of God, when you fear God, listen carefully, when you fear God, your son will keep shining. Your sun will keep shining and your star will keep on rising. Proverbs 4.18 says, The path of the just is like a shining sun. It shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. And if you go to 2 Samuel 23, who is a just person? A just person is a person that fears God. Look at it. It says, the God of Israel, 2 Samuel 23, verse 2, the God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. This was David speaking. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. So in other words, Proverbs 4, 18, if anyone fears God, the Bible says right there, that person's sun will keep shining brighter and that person's star will keep rising. In other words, when you fear God, you will always experience his supernatural enlargement. Verse 4 of that 2 Samuel 23 goes on to say, And he, that is the person that fears God, shall be like the light of the morning sun. Like the light of the morning when the sun rises a morning without clouds. Now family understand that the, the sun shines the brightest where there are no clouds in the sky. You all know that. And so the analogy scripture is saying here is that when you are just and when you fear God, your star will always shine bright. You will never be in obscurity. You will always be in prominence. You will never be the tail. You will always be the head. You will never be beneath. You will always be above. Your sun will keep shining. And your star will keep rising. Praise the name of the Lord. But you must fear God. You must fear God. God has promised great things for this church at this junction. Look at one of the things. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Bible says in verse 20, Concerning this church and concerning as many that belong to this commission, he says, your son shall no longer go down. Maybe somebody is here. The story of your own success has been roller coaster. Go up, down, up, down. But that's not the plan of God. When you start succeeding, God's mind is that you don't stop. The Bible says, concerning Isaac, the man prospered. He began to prosper. Then he continued to prosper until he became exceedingly prosperous. That is God's agenda for his people. He never intends for any of his people to go from grace to grass. In Deuteronomy, he said you will be above only. That's your only permitted position. However, for your son not to go down, you must fear the Lord. And his promise to this church, he says your son shall no longer go down. Nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be ended. And then in verse 22, he says, a little one, pastor, this came strong to me, that a little one will become a thousand, 
A small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. One translation says, I will make it happen quickly. In a twinkling of an eye, God will fill every DLCC church up to the overflow. In a twinkling of an eye, you'll be having multiple, multiple, multiple services. In a twinkling of an eye, you'll be planting different churches, not only in California, Pastor, in other states of the union. I will make it happen quickly, says the Lord. Haggai chapter 2, 6 says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while. I will shake heaven and earth and sea and dry land. I will shake all nations. And they shall come to DLCC, the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord, and the glory of the latter temple. I feel something special about this 14th anniversary crossroad. It is a destiny-defining junction in this commission. For people of God, the message is brought to us, Acts 9.31. These three things, as a church, as individuals, we have got to embrace it. We have got to seek God's for rest, and we have got to walk in the fear of the Lord. We have got to walk in the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. People of God, it is so sad today. It's an epidemic, that's what I call it. In Christendom, there's an e epidemic of the lack of the fear of God. There is much talk today about Christians, among Christians, about the love of God. But there's hardly any talk, hardly any attention to the fear of God. People today are celebrating love, celebrating grace. And they've even misinterpreted grace to the point that they have made a disgrace of grace. The grace you hear on the media a lot these times has nothing to do with the grace that is spoken of in the Bible. And it is so sad. People do not read their Bibles. People just go by what this tele-evangelist said and what that tele-evangelist said. I'm sorry for you. If all you do is to listen to what people on TV say, I'm not saying there are no true men of God. They are. But regardless, you need to know the Bible for yourself. Recently, I read about one popular pastor. It really, really caught me to the heart. Because this guy, I've known about him many years ago. And this guy, I don't want to mention his name because we take no glory in such things. But he just came out and said he's no longer a Christian and began to repent of the things he taught. And you know what? It's so sad because a lot of people that followed him and not their Bibles were going to renounce Christianity exactly like he did. Because a lot of Christians don't know the Bible. They know what T.D. Jakes said. They know what Ben Hinn said. They know what everybody said. But what thought says the Lord, they don't know. And the reason why you need to know your Bible yourself, because this is the truth of the matter. Some men of God are men. Women of God are women. Wherever they failed, hopefully in time to come, they and God will reconcile. Meanwhile, the rest of you that are followed sheepishly, you are going on the way that is not good. They celebrate the love of God. And God is love. No doubt about it. We are saved by grace. No doubt about it. But the truth of the matter is, you cannot truly say you love God if you don't fear him. That is the truth of the matter. Because the love of God is based on the fear of God. Deuteronomy, look at it, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. It says, and now Israel, what does the Lord require of you? God requires. To fear the Lord your God. To walk in all, not some, all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
Family, I want to ask you a question. In this scripture I just read, what appears first? Is it the fear of the Lord or the love of God? Which one comes first? I can't hear you. Fear of the Lord comes first. Because the fear of the Lord is the basis for true love for God. Look at it. Your professed love for God and your passionate service in his house will all amount to nothing if you lack the fear of God. And you better believe that churches are full of workers, full of leaders, full of pastors, evangelists, prophets, apostles that serve God, but they don't fear him. Many years ago, a great man of God in this country, tele-evangelist, again, I don't, I don't want to shame people, so I will not mention name. Many years ago in this country, really fell from grace to the point that he had to be imprisoned. Okay, fraud was involved, tax evasion was involved. And another man of God went to go visit him in the prison and, and looked at him and said, I know you. When you are preaching, you so much preach about the love of God, you are even crying. I know your ministry. How? But I can't reconcile it. How can somebody that speaks so passionately about God, how can you end up in this kind of situation? He was not condemning him, but he was just trying to understand. And with tears in his eyes, the man of God that was in prison said, Oh, I love God. I just did not fear him. Church is full of people. We are passionate about God. But did it occur to you, you can be passionate about your BMW as well. You can be passionate about your job. You can be passionate about your hair. Passion is nothing without the basis of fear of God. It's like an abusive husband. And sadly, that's how I know there's none of them in this house. Amen. There are better be none. <laughs> I, I dislike abuse with a passion. Because growing up, growing up, I had an uncle that was very, I hated the way the guy, he was rich, but I hated how he treated women. I hated how he treated the, the women in his life. I hated it. He was a very abusive person. So I cannot tolerate, and I know none of the LCC men are abusive. Love you very much. But anyway, if you are a Christian, and you say you love God, and you don't fear him, you are like an abusive husband who will beat up the wife black and blue. Then after, we come with roses. Oh, I can't remove this one. <laughs> with a box of chocolates. Sorry, baby. We'll even help him put uh, alcohol, banded on where he busted up. Only to go back to do the next thing the following day. Is that love? If there is no respect, if you treat somebody with disregard, you treat somebody with disrespect, don't open your mouth to say you love them. Now, if you are sinning without restraint, doing the same things unbelievers do, Please, even if you cry during worship, even if you are always there when they need volunteers, please do not tell me you love God. The basis of the love for God, and for some reason, for some reason God is bringing this word to us as individuals. He's calling us to a renewed commitment of a love for God. The real way, people of God, that you prove your love for God is by fearing him and by walking in all of his ways. It is by departing from evil and doing good. Psalm 37, 27 says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Another scripture says, the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. That's the fear of the Lord. Make no mistake about it, people of God. Make no mistake about it. Doing good 
is extremely crucial to your salvation. Another thing I believe God is anointing me to do in the body of Christ, Pastor, is to correct this doctrine of grace that people have polluted. Salvation has everything to do with doing good works. Everything to do. Did you not read Philippians chapter 2? The second part of verse 12 says, Walk out your own salvation. With what? Walk out your own salvation. They'll be saying works is, uh, is law. There is very much works in grace. Walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. Please, people of God, do not listen or pay attention to any adulterated message of grace. Anything that you didn't hear from your pastor in this church, don't listen to it. The internet is full of trash, but they are not your pastors. You listen to the one God has put over you, and you will make it to heaven in Jesus' name. Good works is very important, and that's pretty much what the fear of the Lord is. Doing good, living right. God show me something in Proverbs chapter 16. Awesome revelation, let's go there. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 6. This is to refute people that try to say, because of grace, good works does not matter anymore. Because of grace, nothing could be further than the truth. And unfortunately, people that don't read their Bible, all you need to read is all the new epistles. All the epistles in the New Testament. Read it, and you will know that it is important for you to do good works. It's important to you to live right. Look at what it says. The Lord showed me this. It was mind-blowing. Proverbs 16, 6. The Bible says, In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. Atonement there means grace. But look at the second part. It now says, And by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. And the Lord began to show me. He said, I provided grace to give my people the power to depart from evil. Grace is not a license to sin, but rather grace is the empowerment not to sin. Because even though the dispensation has changed, the God has not changed. His holiness has not changed. His standard has not changed. And without holiness, nobody will see him. So you need to understand that good works are very important. Yes, we are saved by grace, not by works. But listen carefully, family. You are saved by grace for good works. The very purpose, when they say something is for something, that means the purpose of grace is for you to do good works. If I said I made this microphone, for the purpose of amplifying my voice. This microphone is made for the purpose of amplifying my voice. That car is manufactured for the purpose of transporting me. In the same way, grace, you are saved by grace. You are not saved by works, but you are saved by grace for the purpose of doing good works. Go with me again, another mind-blowing scripture, Ephesians 2. People that mess up the gospel of grace, they stop at verse 8. They shouldn't have stopped at verse 8 of Ephesians 2. Let's read verse 8 of Ephesians 2. 1, 2, let's go everybody. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself is the gift of God. And they stop there. They stop there and say, is grace, is grace, is grace. Nothing you do is grace. But all they needed to do is to go to verse 10. Can you guys go to verse 10, please? Let's read verse 10. Everybody, come on, people of God. For we created in Christ. For what? For what? For what? Did you see? If only they moved, a, they read a little bit further, they will understand. That it doesn't end that we are saved by grace, not by our works. 
They would have read further to discover that we are saved by grace for the purpose of good works. Now, if this thing is not performing the purpose for which it was created, what will you do with it? You will trash it. You will discard it. So, using that same analysis, what do you think God will do with a Christian that was saved by grace for the purpose of doing good works, but though he received grace, he's not doing good works. What will God do to that individual? Aren't you bold enough to answer? I'll tell you, Jesus said it himself. He said, if you are neither hot or cold, I will spew you out of my mouth. In another place, he said, I will blot you out of my book. It's not the name of unbelievers that is in the book of life. People say once saved, ever saved. There is no such thing. Absolutely not. If Apostle Paul could say, I discipline my body, 1 Corinthians 9, so that after I have preached this gospel, I will not become a castaway. You are telling me once saved, ever saved. He said, God knows those who are his. Whoever names the name of the Lord, you better depart from iniquity. Family, he's calling his church. This one and the church universal, he's calling us to the fear of the Lord. Look at it again in Titus chapter. There's so many scriptures. All Christians need to do is to go into the Bible for themselves. And stop listening to ministers taking things out of context. You will see it. Look at it in Titus chapter 2.14. Titus 2.14, it says, Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. It's in Titus 3 verse 8 again. Titus 3 verse 8 says, this is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Family, any person who claims to be saved but denies the importance of good works stands the risk of going to hell. And sadly, people of God, there are people who once professed Christ. It is sad, but it is the truth. Who are rotted in hell this same moment. Titus 1.16 says, they professed to know God, but in works they deny him. One translation says, but by their actions, they deny and disown him. Your confession is nothing if it doesn't line up with your actions. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Disqualified means you started the race but you did things. You went against the rule of the race. At the end of the finish line, you are disqualified. You cannot disqualify somebody that was not qualified before. Is somebody getting what I just said right now? Because one point I really want to prove from the word of God tonight is that you can't take your salvation for granted. We can't play church, people. The day is approaching. Jesus will really come. It's actually going to, be hap going to happen. And only those who are ready will go. That's the truth of the matter. Matthew 25, only the virgin that were ready went. You cannot disqualify somebody who was not first qualified. The word, the prefix D-I-S. It means you are undoing something that had been done before. And he says in that scripture, if you deny the Lord in good works, 
stand the risk of being disqualified. But that will not be our portion in the mighty name of Jesus. That's why in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourselves. Examine yourselves, and I pray we will do that tonight. Another scripture said before, judge yourself so that you will not be judged. Many years ago, the Holy Spirit prompted me to ask him to show me the woman I didn't know. Because nobody knows you like God. So he dared me. He said, let me show you your real self. Not the one people see on the outside. Meanwhile, I'm a pastor's wife at this time. This was so many years ago. And by the time God showed me, I was like Isaiah. I said, whoa, it's me. But I thank God. Because after death, I don't have that opportunity to be doing that examination. After death comes what? The judgment. He says, examine yourself, people of God. As to whether you are in faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that we are not disqualified. We will not be disqualified in Jesus' name. We must pay attention to living right. We must pay attention. Remember what scripture said. It says all his ways. Because sometimes you hear a message like this. She's talking to the adulterer. She's talking to the fornicator. She's talking to, no, I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to the one keeping malice. I'm talking to the one <laughs> that's proud. I'm talking to everybody. Examine yourself. Say your neighbor, examine yourself. Then tell yourself, I will examine myself. Family, a Christian who keeps on sinning willfully puts his eternity in jeopardy. A Christian who keeps on sinning willfully, puts his eternity into jeopardy. Hebrews 10, 26 says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment. A Christian who keeps on sinning willfully, don't think that the blood of Jesus will speak for you. It, it will not. There remains no more sacrifice. If sin has become your lifestyle, he says, but a settled expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Then he now said in verse, he now said in verse 30, actually let me read verse 29. He says, of how much worse punishment do you suppose Will he be thought worthy? Who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Anytime you are sinning willfully, deliberately doing the things you know in your heart you are not supposed to do. You are trampling the Son of God underfoot. You are counting the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified a common thing and insulting the spirit of grace. Then he now says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge not sinners, but his own people. Can you read verse 31 together with me, everybody? For it is a fearful thing to fall. You and I will not fall into his hands in Jesus' name. But we must have a zero tolerance for sin. And if we do sin, we must be quick to repent. People of God. Salvation is more than just saying the sinner's prayer. Somewhere along the line, that's another thing we need to correct in the church world. Salvation is more than you answer an altar call and you say the sinner's prayer. It goes beyond that. Listen carefully to what I have right here. Saying the sinner's prayer alone will not get you into heaven. Just a one-time confession of faith, it will not get you into heaven, but rather a lifetime commitment to walk in the fear of the Lord from the beginning to the end. Now, I want you to read what I have on the screen and make it personal. Say, just a one-time confession of faith won't get me into heaven, 
but rather a lifetime commitment to walk, in, to walk in the fear of the Lord from the beginning to the very end. The beginning being the day you answer the altar call. But after the day you answer the altar call, said the sinner's prayer, continue to walk with God. Genesis 5.24 says, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God only takes the ones that are walking with him. He doesn't take the ones who after they said the sinner's prayer, they went back. This is a call to revival. This is a call to a fresh commitment to God. Jesus in another place says, He who endures to the end shall be saved. Hallelujah. People of God, if only the body of Christ would get it, and I want you to get it tonight, because it is so sad in this our generation, because of a lack of the fear of God, there is so much immorality and so much carnality in the church. Anybody agree with me? So much. The man of God had a vision. True story. 10,000 member church. Mega church. And in that vision, God showed him, of this, your 10,000 members, if I were to come right now, only 1% will follow me. Please, what is 1% of 10,000? Pastor, you were good in math now. 100. Think about it. In a congregation of 10,000, only 100. God were to give every pastor in the modern day, especially modern day America, I don't know what their own percentage is. He says we have plenty mega churches. But most of the mega churches are filled with mixed multitude. They are not filled with true disciples. And there is a passion God has put in my husband's heart and mine that everybody he gave us. And I know Pastor Shegun has that same thing too. Pastor Shegun and Pastor Abike. That they all make it to heaven. Because the truth of the matter is, without holiness, nobody will see him. Not because they don't want you to see him, but the Bible says his eyes are too pure to behold sin. There was a story that was told, I don't know whether it was a vision or whether it was just an analogy, but I got to read it somewhere, of three people that died. One was a little child, the other was a drunk man, and the third was an atheist. And all of them died at the same moment. So in that vision, the young child was taken straight up to heaven. The drunkard was going down to hell. As the atheist was going down to hell, the atheist screamed, I knew it. You are a wicked God. You are this, this, this. If you claim to be the God of love that you are, why are you sending people to hell? And God said, angel, go get him. And so the angel went to go get, the, the, they pull up the drunkard, sorry, the atheist, stop him from going down to hell. And they brought him. The moment he stepped the front of the pearly gates of heaven, he began to scream, take me out! Take me out of this place. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Take me out. And so they threw him back to hell. And the moral of that vision is this. That the glory of heaven will be hotter for a sinner than the fire of hell. So it is not God that don't want people to come to heaven. But that place, sin, cannot be there at all. And... God sees sin in a sinner the same way it is in a so-called carnal Christian. There is no distinction. If a carnal Christian is holding on to sin, it is the same way the censor of heaven will pick it up. The censor of heaven will not discriminate that this one, Lord Jesus, he made an altar call. I'm telling you today, altar call without commitment to work with the Lord is zero. 
without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So much sexual immorality in the church today. Paul noticed it, he said, in the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 5, he says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality that is not even named among Gentiles. But the disturbing thing is verse 2, when he says, their reaction, instead of being broken, they are now puffed up. They are now puffed up and they don't mourn. They are not broken. Today I see it. People are not broken over sin. There's a particular individual, you know, a Christian that I've known for a while. And right now, you even don't know how to call so, ooh, somebody a Christian, somebody not a Christian. I don't know, but a professing Christian. And this guy, this guy with, if I don't know how to say it in, in English, that it will sound very drastic. But he's, okay, let me say bold face. He's still married. Yes, uh, he's in the process of a divorce, but he's still married. So when I got to know what was going on, I said, look, you are still married. How many years do you have? Stay away from women. First time he told me, yes, I said. Long story short, before I know what happened, gotten together with some person is living in his house. Long story short, I have a child. Still married. So I looked at him. But what broke my heart? You can't. I don't know whether it's just me. When I sin, I can't rest. I, I know how I feel about but it's like nothing, nothing happened. And this person has been a professed Christian for so many years. Paul said puffed up. They don't mourn. Christians don't mourn over sin anymore. We become so insensitive and hardened to it, and it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. Because by so doing, if we are not careful, God forbid that we miss heaven. But that will not be our portion in Jesus' name. People of God, make no mistake about it. Salvation in Christ, and I want you to really get it, salvation in Christ is first and foremost about a real change in your behavior, not just a change in your circumstance. I'm going to say it one more time. That salvation, Christianity, the very first message Jesus preached was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God's priority, more than blessing you with material things, is changing your heart and your life to be conformed to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Today in the body of Christ, we have reversed it. People seek things and they don't seek righteousness. That's the truth of the matter. We must not allow ourselves to be that way. Because Christianity is majorly about a change in our character. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become new. I'm a pastor. I know that there are a lot. Some people can go to church, go to the club rather on Saturday and still come to church. Some people can put, still be drinking alcohol. We have our different hats we wear. But if we want to make it, if we want to see God, because at the end of the day, that's what matters. As I'm preaching now, some people are crossing over to eternity. At the end of the day, what matters is that you see God. And you and I can only see him when we walk in the fear of the Lord all our days and we pursue holiness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People of God, let's not get carried away. Let's not have itching ears. God is calling us to a renewed commitment to the fear of God. And like I said out at the beginning, the Bible says in Proverbs that with the fear of the Lord comes honor, comes riches. There's nothing God will not give you when you honor him with your life. But if there's something I really want to 
pass across today because I'm a pastor. And I see church folks. Sometimes, pastor, you counsel some people and you say, if not that you know you preach the truth, you wonder why is this person still living this way? We may not see you. We may not know you. We may not be with you in private, but God does. And we have hearts for you. When I say we, we pastors, we have hearts that all of us will make it to heaven. I want to end tonight with 1 Corinthians. Let's all go there. People of God, we've got to walk in the fear. We've got to walk in the fear of the Lord. We've got to do right by God. Examine yourselves tonight. Please do not try to look pretty or anything. If there's something that needs to go in your life, Jesus Christ said, if it is your eye that offends you, cut it off. If it is your hand, cut it off. He says it's better to enter into life amputated or without an eye than to be cast into fire. That's what Jesus said. I don't know where they got the idea that all you need to make heaven is to make a confession at the altar. It's more than that. That's just the beginning. If you stop walking, he doesn't take you. He doesn't rapture you. So let's go to 1 Corinthians tonight. Hallelujah. Let's say be the name of the Lord. Piano people, can you come please? God is calling his church to revival and to a renewed commitment to walk in the fear of the Lord all the days of our life. It begins with you, it begins with me. I dare you tonight to pray the prayer I pray to God. God, show me the me that I did not know. The psalmist said, I believe it's in Psalm 19, who can discern all his errors? Forgive me my secret faults. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go with me there, people of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I begin reading from verse 1. Paul says, and I am saying to you tonight, Moreover, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Those are symbols of baptism of water, even baptism of the Holy Spirit. But he says, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But well, listen to verse 5. But with most of them. This is the scary part. In Luke chapter 13, somebody asked Jesus, are there few that will be saved? Then Jesus said, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Many are taking the broad way. Straight and narrow is the way that leads to life. There are few that find it. There's a precious man of God, Pastor Shegun. Again, I will cover his name. He didn't start out preaching adulterated message of grace. He started preaching the true word of God. Righteousness, holiness. But in his own opinion, the person I'm talking about is one of the leading proponents today of this false grace. But in his opinion, his church was not growing. That's how he said he had a revelation that um, he's preaching condemnation. And condemnation is driving people. Acts chapter 5. It was his sweet words that grew the church. Bible says when Peter told Ananias and Sapphira, one after the other, how dare you lie against the Holy Spirit? They fell down dead. First the husband, second the wife. The Bible says fear came on the whole church. And the next thing, they were multiplied. The, the guy should have been more patient. So that's how he changed his message to what he's preaching today. Popular! There's a reason why I'm saying it. Because I know many people they listen to someone beyond their pastor's own. No problem about that. But 
if it goes against what you are being taught in the house God planted, you trash it. I don't care if he's the most popular pastor in the whole wide world. But by the time they are repenting, you won't be there. By the time... <laughs> pastor Sheik. By the time they are saying, ah, what I preached the other time is wrong. <laughs> it's too late. For you that follow them sheepishly like... Like my people say, like Mumu. And so he changed his message. And sure enough, he is the pastor of a mega, mega, mega church today. But God told me, there are many mega churches. They are not full of disciples. They are full of mixed multitude. But as for us, God has called us to raise disciples. After the commission in Matthew 28, he sent us to raise disciples. This church will explode. I've seen it. Just as our church in Houston. But you need to know that what will last will take time to build. What will last will take time. He said you will take your root downward. And then you will bear fruit upward. So by the grace of God, we cannot be moved. We are not after multitude. We are after disciples. And as we continue, disciples will come. Acts chapter 6. The word of the Lord increased. And the numbers of disciples were multiplied. We keep feeding you the word. We are mega. But we will not compromise in Jesus' name. Look at what he said. He said, but with many of them. In fact, he said, with most of them, God was not well pleased. But their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. If God who used his mouth to say, I'm taking you, Israel, out of Egypt, the original beginning count was a million people. Of that original number, only two made it. So when God is saying with most of them, he wasn't pleased. Who can minus two from one million? Don't even bother. But can you see that is a very shocking, there's even no, you can't even put it statistically. Zero, 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 zero point, what do you want to call that? But with most of them, wasn't pleased. Now, look at verse six. It says, these things became our examples. So that you should learn from their mistake. And you should also know the kind of God we have. He is loving, but he will not compromise. And if a million people less two, he could cause their bodies to scatter in the wilderness. You had better believe that he's still the same God. And we had better strive to be among those few that he is pleased with. He says, now these things became our examples to the extent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Verse 8 now says, nor let us commit sexual immorality. It's in the church. Singles are having sex more than married people. Let's stop it. God will help you. As some of them did. Verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Verse 10, nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happen to them as examples. He doesn't want it to happen to us too. And they were written for our admonition. Here is where I'm going. Upon whom the end of the ages have come. Family, we are in the last days. Let he who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Let's rise on our feet tonight. Change my heart, O oh Lord. Jesus. Make it ever true. If you know the song, sing it to the Lord. Change my heart, oh Lord, may I be like you, may I be like you, 
Let's sing it from the top again. Change my heart, oh Lord. Change my heart, oh Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. God is going to baptize you and me with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to verse 2 of Isaiah 11. Glory be to God. 
Glory be to God. We're going to read verse 2 and 3 together as a family. At the count of 2, 1, 2, let's go. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Verse 3. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes. Nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Now you will make this person say, my delight from now on by the power of the Holy Spirit shall be in the fear of the Lord I shall not love the Lord I shall not, I shall not love the things of the world I shall not be guilty of the loss of flesh the loss of eyes or the pride of life I will fear the Lord come on and pray for yourself tonight pray for your children tonight father I pray for my children father I pray for myself Ah, let your spirit rest upon me. Let your spirit rest upon my husband. The spirit of the fear of God. Let it, get it guide me. Let it control all of my children. Let it control all of my church family. Let it control everyone in DLCC. Father, Lord God, we shall live and walk in the fear of the Lord. We shall make it to the end. 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 To the end. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Come on and give him praise. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give him glory. Give him glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Do you know this old SU song? The old SU song says, When you come and collect your people, remember me, O oh Lord. 